Domenico Michele II Maria Puccini. Sono io. I miei amici mi chiamano Giacomo. My singers, I am Maestro. To everyone else, I am Pucci. Except to some who call me Monsieur Butterfly. I have come here to lyric stage at Mississippi College in Clinton, Mississippi for the premiere of my opera, La Panchula del West, 10 December 1910. Very exciting. But now, I must see to La Posta. Do dove sono le lettere? Ah, si, grazie. I, I must make the apologia for this, uh, uh, matza? Cane. Ah, si, cane. I love the fast automobile. Some years ago, in my Clement, I drive very fast at night. Around the mountain, I want to go this way, but the Clement went that way and made the roll over like this. The leg sometimes gives me trouble. <coughs> now I have the lunch. Very fast. Also, the motor boat in New York. I saw the most beautiful boat, but for many thousands of dollars. The salesmen say I can make the down payment of $500, then to pay the rest when I return to Italy. I must have this boat. A wealthy patron at the Metropolitan begged me for the autograph. I say to him, I will write for you the beginning of Musetta's Waltz with the autograph for $500. He was only too happy. So I made the down payment on the boat. Dear Master, Welcome once again to America, and congratulations on the recent premiere. My dream is to sing the great soprano roles of Puccini. I know that I must have the finest of musical educations, perhaps abroad. Where did you receive your musical training? My first teacher was my uncle, Fortunato Maggi. He taught me singing and organ. Whenever I sang a false note, he would kick me on the shin. I was kicked very often. <laughs> now, at the, when I hear a wrong note sung, my knee does the... the come si dice in English? Fremono? Scossa? Jerk. I see. My knee does the jerk. Like this. Sometimes at a performance, I spend the entire evening like this. <laughs> By the age of 14, I earned money sell, to play organ in church. My brother and his friends moved the blowers for the organ pipes. To get extra money for cigarettes, I had to steal the organ pipes, which we would then sell to the junkie. I would then make changes in the music to avoid the notes of the missing pipes. I went to the conservatory in Milan, 1880. At the age of 22, I was too old for admission, but I scored higher on the examinations than anyone else, so I was accepted. While there, I studied with Amilcare Ponchielli, who composed the opera La Gioconda. He had a great passion for the opera, and this was encouraging to me. For a time in Milan, I shared my room with Mascagni, who wrote Cavalleria Rusticana. While we lived together, we were destitute. We ate mostly beans. I hate beans. 
now, whenever I want to play the joke on someone, I send them a recipe for beans. <laughs> on the wall, we put up a map of Milan to show with, with red marks to show which street to avoid because of the danger of running into creditors. Once I even hid in the closet to avoid a creditor. Still, together, we save enough to purchase a score of Wagner's Parsifal. And we study it for many hours. Compared to Wagner, we are all mandolin players. Cooking in your room was forbidden. So we cover up the sounds of frying by loudly playing on the piano. Once, I even pawned my coat, like Colline in La Boheme. Not for a dying Mimi, no. I needed money to take out a pretty girl. I had to spend three long, cold winter months without a coat. It was worth it. Mascali and I would frequently have wine and meals at the Trattoria Aida because the proprietor there gave us credit. For years he gave us credit. I think he took pity on the starving students, knowing he was not likely ever to be repaid. You should have seen the look on his face when, after the premiere of my first opera, I returned to Milan with 1,000 lire to pay off my old debt. This is the way it happened. After graduation, at the summer home of Ponchieri, I met Ferdinando Fantana, poet and dramatist. Together, we agreed to collaborate on an opera. Later, we called it Le Ville, to be entered in a competition for the best one-act opera written by an Italian. Le Ville was not even given the honorable mention the judges say because of the illegibility of the score, it was not even considered. Fontana then arranged for a backer's audition. Amongst those invited was Boito, composer of Metastophile. I went to the piano to play badly and to sing even worse. The music from the Ville. But those present were enthusiastic. Boito arranged for a theater, and Ricordi, the publisher, was persuaded to print the libretto of the opera. The premiere was very crowded. Afterwards, I had to borrow money to send a telegram to my mother. A Teen curtain calls. First finale repeated three times. The critics say, Puccini to the stars, applause from start to finish. Puccini's opera is a small and precious masterpiece. Ricordi then contracted for the copyright to Levity and included 200 lire each month to work on a new opera. Also, a 2,000 lire advance against the future earnings. I used half of this to pay off my old debt at the IED. There is more. I would be very grateful to hear your advice on building my career. May I join you at your hotel to discuss this at greater length? I can be reached at the address on the back of my photograph. One must be very careful in these matters. Some years ago in Vienna, I was in my hotel room in the morning. The telephone rang, and a young woman wished an interview. I was still in my pyjama, pajamas? But what to do? So I said she could come to my suite. When she arrived, she was with a small boy holding a violin case. I assumed she wished me to hear him play, so I excused myself into the bedroom and get dressed. 
when I return, she said her little brother had to go to his violin lesson. She stood there completely naked. I felt too sorry for the poor lunatic just to send her away. Where do you find the themes for your melodies? As I come to know the character, the melodies which are most descriptive come to me. That is why I must have the libretto before I can compose series. Sometimes the melody for one character will lead to a theme for another. For example, when Mimi sings to Rodolfo in La Bohème, Si mi chiamano Mimi! I don't have to sing, only to compose. This becomes her theme, which will return later. But what to do for Musetta, who is so different from Mimi? The opposite in personality. La Tosca, and I asked Ricordi, my publisher, to secure the rights. Sardou would not agree. Ten years later, he finally consented. After that, it took two years more to complete the opera. At our first meeting, Sardou asked to hear samples of what I had already written for Tosca. So I go to the piano and play, and he was enchanted. What I had played was music from Manona Sto in La Boheme, since I had not yet written anything for Tosca. <laughs> but Sartu did not know this, and he was enchanted. The librettist told Sartu of his intentions of having Tosca sing a long aria over the body of her lover before leaping to her death, and he asked for my opinion. 
I opened my copy of the libretto and pointed to what I had already written next to the words of the aria. I said to him, this is the sobravito? Overcoat. Ah, see, si. this is the overcoat aria. Sardou says, je ne comprends pas. I say to him, an overcoat aria is one which will never be heard, because by this time the audience will be too busy putting on their overcoats. <laughs> Sardou was then convinced that I had a sure sense of the theater, but I had some doubts of my own. Perhaps it would be better if a Frenchman were to set your play to music. No, Tosca is a Roman work. It needs your Italian song. But Verdi, our great Verdi, once considered Tosca and gave it up. The sign and the subject intimidated him. Do you wonder, Monsieur Sardou, that I am afraid? Verdi was not intimidated. Verdi is old. Verdi is tired. You should be encouraged by the fact that a great composer for the theater, such as he, had confidence in Tosca and recognized the great opera, which it is. But my music is tenuous, is delicate, is written in a different register. Registers, Monsieur Puccini, there is only talent. Who was I to argue with such logic? I wish to be very correct in my audience, so I write to my friend Guido Vandini, go to a priest or to a monk and ask what the priests recite when a cortege with a bishop goes from the sacristy to the high altar to sing the solemn Te Deum in honor of a military victory. I wish to use this in Tosca. We receive no reply. So I write again. Go to the bishop with the request. If he does not supply it, I will write to the pope and have him fired like any other imbecile employee. I shall write a funeral march for religion. I shall become a Protestant and swear for the rest of my life. Sardou was not so concerned about the accuracy. He wished for Tosca to leave to her death from the ramparts of San Angelo into the river Tiber. But the Tiber flows some 20 meters on the other side of the castello. Sardou says, oh, that is nothing. The critics, of course, never seem to understand this. But the public, even at La Scala, filled the theater for every performance. Butterfly, <laughs> who are your favorite singers? In June of 1897, while I was working on Tosca, my handyman and hunting companion, Manfredi, called out to me. Someone pleads for an interview. He speaks like a Neapolitan and says he is a singer. A little runt of a fellow with a bit of a mustache. Wears his hat to one side and calls himself Caruso. Tell him I'm busy. I told him already, but he still refuses to leave. So I call out to him. Kiele, who are you? He sings, his son, son un poeta. He's from Boya. So I let him in. He wishes 
to sing for me, che gioia, ma niente. Bene. But maestro, the high C at the end, gives me trouble. Non è problema. Too many sing the whole aria badly just to hold themselves for the C. So I go to the piano and play, and he sings, che gioia, ma niente. of a woman in Central Park Zoo. I say to him, an artist of your stature should never do this in public. <laughs> Ma, no. He really does have a marvelous sense of humor and does not take himself too seriously all the time. Once, there was the, in Chicago, there was the double bill of Cavalleria Rusticana and the Pagliacci. Caruso was to sing Canio, in Pagliacci, while another tenor was to sing Turrigu in Cavalry. There was an announcement made that the Turrigu was ill, but would sing the performance anyway. Backstage, he told Caruso he was afraid he would not be able to complete the performance. Caruso said, the first aria is off stage anyway. I will sing that for you, no one will know, and you can save yourself for the rest of the performance. When Caruso sang the offstage aria for Turiu, the audience was only polite. But the grumbling was heard that it was obvious that the tenor was very ill. But when Caruso comes to sing Canio and Pagliacci, the audience cheer his every note. He say this make him aware of the value of good advanced publicity. My best Tosca is Maria Cerizza. She's a beautiful blonde, very athletic, very well known and importante. Because of my cigarettes, she won't come near to me anyway. She hates to wear the dark wig for Tosca. I say to her, there are blondes in Italy, and they are the most beautiful in the world.
extended tradition of singing the Visi Darpe flat on the floor. Con il mio prezzo. At the dress rehearsal, she was accidentally pushed off the couch by the barricade. She did not have enough time to get up again before beginning the aria. I shouted from the back of the theater, Never do it any other way! It was from God. I coached her in the music for many hours. Tosti, the baritone who sang it with her, thought he was reduced to leaning up against the back wall until she decided to become upright again. I say to her, you must walk on the clouds of melody. with Toscanini asked me to approve her for the Paris production only last year. Oh, we approve. She was perhaps a little too extravagant, ordering new gowns made for herself in Paris. After the dress rehearsal, I was having coffee, and she came backstage to ask what I thought of her new costumes. I said, boy, Everything is perfect, except in the last act, when Manon is starving and penniless, your gown is new and spotless. So I threw my coffee on it. <laughs> she was very angry. <sighs> Dear Maestro Puccini, you have written some of the most popular music in the world and are now called the only legitimate successor to Verdi. Eh. How have you been treated by the critics throughout your career? With Le Villiers? Eh. With Edgar, my second opera, at La Scala? Massacre! Never had the critics like me at La Scala.
Mano Masto was my third opera, and after this I never had to worry about the poverty which had plagued me all my life. My music is performed all over the world. Everywhere there is opera, there is Puccini, eh? At the premiere of Manolesco, I hid in the back of a lower box and bit my nails off. I still do that. The premiere was very crowded. Oh, Mascagni was there! He made the grand entrance with his cloak thrown over his shoulders. He acknowledged the recognition of the crowd. Seeing me trying to hide in the box, he called out, Hey, Puccini! Buona fortuna! Ah! <laughs> but once the music began, the audience started to cheer. By the time of the aria, Donna non vidi mai, they were calling me from the box. Again and again, they called me to the stage. At the end, there were 30 curtain calls. Then the critics begin to hail Puccini's truly Italian genius. Come mai? Only last year in Paris, Manolo School was not treated so kindly. Where we needed a pastel, he gave us an etching, totally lacking in charm. If Massenet ever feared of being dethroned, he should sleep soundly now. Massenet had already written his version of Manon, but the French public, for the second performance, the theater took in 65,000 francs, a record. With La Bohème at Palermo, every aria had to be encored. At the end, the audience refused to leave until the entire finale was repeated. By that time, half the orchestra had gone and the soprano and tenor were in their street clothes. Non importa. We repeat the finale. But the critics? Their music is too familiar. A medley of reminiscences of already popular fragments, a transcription of entire scenes from Manolesco. One said, what has pushed Puccini on this deplorable road of boy? This one had submitted a libretto to me, which I had rejected, so what else could I expect? But with Tosca, they were so shocked that they sigh for the lyrical tenderness of Bohem. Very consistent, eh? If the gentlemen of the press are so full of bile against, who cares a fig? If the public takes my side, cretini. How do they dare to dismiss in one evening what I have given years of my life to create? Don't Take it so personally, Puccini. So you can say I don't like it, that's all right. But to say it is not Verdi, it is not Massonet, of course it is not Massonet, it's Puccini! From the first note to the last! Ew! Basta! Sometimes I have this problem with my throat. If you will excuse us for a few minutes, we will return to you shortly. I am told that our sponsors, Lyric Stage, are selling t shirts in the lobby. <laughs> we will return with you in just a few minutes.
recognizing Puccini. When curtain fell, she allowed vigorously, while I shrugged with indifference. She said, what's the matter? You don't like it? I said, no. It is the work of an amateur. She said, well, then you must be the unusual ignorante. It is the finest thing Puccini has done. I said, the best arias are from Verdi, the best choruses, Bizet, Basta. Then I invite her to supper. She said she has another engagement and she hurried away. The next day, I read in the newspaper Puccini's own views on Tosca. That woman caught me for Beethoven. Hmm. Someone told me that I am the most frequently photographed artist in the world. Has anyone ever photographed a critic? Dear Maestro Pucci, often while you travel abroad, you are accompanied by your handsome son, Tony. A very like his father, eh? Does your wife choose to remain in Italy? Elvira does not like to travel. The ship gives her the seasickness, and she is not really at ease in public life. We met in 1884. She was beautiful, tall and dignified. She was also married. I was captivated. Unfortunately, it soon became clear that she was with child. So she came to be with me. There was much scandal. In the beginning, ours was the great passion. Even in our deepest poverty, before Manon Lescaut, when she wore homemade shoes, she walked like a goddess. But always very possessive of me, very ambitious. When I would procrastinate in the composing, she would threaten to return to her husband unless I would finish the work. She would lock me away with my piano. So while she prepared the meals, I would sneak a friend in through the window while I climbed out to go hunting. By the time dinner was ready, I would have crawled back in. When some of my colleagues, like Mascani with his cavalleria, achieved a claim before I did, she could not forgive them for such easy success. And she became more and more unhappy when I traveled to supervise rehearsals or meet with librettists. She still does not understand my relationships with other women. I say to her, these casual amours have no relevance to our more solid relationship. All artists cultivate these little gardens in order to delude themselves that they are not finished and old and torn by strife. You imagine immense affairs. In reality, 
is nothing but a fleeting sport to which we men give a fleeting thought, without sacrificing that which is serious and sacred. And that is the family. My wife Elvira does not believe me either. <laughs> she is not so jealous of Sibyl. Sibyl Seligman, you have read about her in the newspapers, no? Such a topic for gossip. Ma, no. Ours is not the love affair. Perhaps something more intimate. I share with her my thoughts and confide in her always. She is a devoted friend, even helping to find the subject for compositions. She bought me this pipe. The all night composing with nothing but coffee and cigarettes. Come, I see the I say, chain smoking? See, she believes that chain smoking is responsible for this problem with my throat. Not. But the women? When I am no longer in love, if you would be so kind as to hold my funeral. Ah, this from Ricordi. More reviews for Panchula at the Metropolitan are enclosed. Congratulations. Brilliant. Audience wild. Under two flags, a $22,000 house riots over Puccini. Ah, this, the New York Times interview. Monsieur Puccini, in talking, used no temperamental or foreign gestures. He adopted no affectations. Even his hair is cut. Why is this so strange? I am not like those musicians who believe you have to have dandruff in order to be a genius. <laughs> now we must begin the new projects without distractions. The hunting season has begun. Go easy, Puccini. Don't let your passion for the birds seduce you away from music. Fun performances for Fanchula have hardly started, and already I must begin the new opera. But this one did not come so easily. Perhaps I should explain uh, about the composition. If you review premiere performances of my operas, it would seem that there are idle years in between. Le Vidi premiered in 1884, Edgar in 1889, La Bohème 1893, Manon Lescaut 1893, La Bohème 1896, Tosca 1900, Madame Butterfly 1904, and now Fanchula in 1910. So what is Puccini doing with himself all this time? In verità, I am working all the time. In reality, I am a mighty hunter. Wild fowl, beautiful women, and good libretti. I have always had more fortune with birds and women than with libretti. Sometimes, even after finding the subject for composition, I spend months sketching musical themes which are later discarded. Ah, uh, after the failure of Butterfly at La Scala. See, Potter del Mondo, a failure for Puccini. I revised the entire opera. What you hear now is quite different than the original manuscript. I ordered all the copies destroyed then revised much of what remained, including the love duet at the end of the first act. I lowered the key of the final trio. I split the second act into two parts instead of one long act, and added the aria Adio Fiorito Asil for the tenor. All the tenors are very grateful. The music for the suicide is uh, much shorter now. So, all this to explain the time between compositions. 
when I am not traveling to supervise rehearsals, even the Lily and Edgar the Awful are performed all over the world, or reading terrible libretti, or writing music which will never be heard, I am working on what will be a complete opera. For some time, I had searched for a theme which was truly American, for an opera about the people in your country. When I saw David Belasco's play, The Girl of the Golden West, I knew that I had my subject. Here was a woman of great stature, so typical of American women. I write to my sister. She is now Mother Superior in the convent. I say to her, the figures of American women are enough to make the Tower of Pisa straighten up. When I die, she will light so many candles that the chapel will burn down. I have decided to write the music for La Fanchula de West to celebrate the strength and courage of the American woman. But the writing was very difficult for me, interrupted by tragedy. It was near midnight in our villa, and the music would not come, so I left the studio to walk in the garden. There, I found Doria, the young girl who was our housekeeper and who looked after Elvira, my wife. We stood near the doorway and chatted. When Elvira came shrieking from her bedchamber, screaming that the poor girl was my mistress. This, this child, like my own daughter. I tried to calm Elvira, but she screamed such horrible language. The poor girl ran terrified to her room. For hours, Elvira pound on her door. I could not stop her. Then, early in the morning, the girl ran to her mother's house. The next day, Elvira chased her through the streets of the village, screaming that she was a meretrice prostitute, and saying that she would kill her if she ever came near to me again. This atmosphere of horror went on for weeks. Doria had locked herself away and refused all food. I write to her mother, assuring her of the young girl's innocence, but the priests kept offering her the solace of confession. A few weeks later, Doria wrote a pathetic little note and poisoned herself. The autopsy revealed that she was still a virgin.
her family was furious with Elvira. They brought suit for defamation of character, persecution, and the menace to life and limb. Elvira was found guilty on all counts. She was sentenced to four months in prison, a fine of 700 lire, and payment of all costs. I had decided to leave her. She was near emotional collapse, and after 20 years, the bond between us was not so easily broken. While preparing for appeals, I spoke with Doria's family often, reminding them that Elvira in her dementia had already suffered. I agreed to give them enough money to build a monument to Doria and a house for themselves near the lake. Finally, they abandoned the suit. When I was able to begin again composing the music for La Panchula de West, it had been after eight months of this nightmare. But now there is peace in our home. Fanchula. I had much trouble with the librettists, senza le parole come posso scrivere la musica. Without the words, how can I write the music? One of them just disappeared, and the other would not respond to my letters. Ah, see, two writers. Manola score. There were six before I got a working libretto, including Leon Cavallo, who wrote I Pagliacci. What is it about Ponchielli, Mascagni, and Leon Cavallo that they have each only had one successful opera? Never. To create the atmosphere of your American West, I include the chance from your Native Americans. Mompo, only a little. It is still the music of Puccini, eh? But now, my fanchula has premiered at the Metropolitan with Caruso, of course, and, Des and Destine as Mini. Opening night was like the Right. The, the scalpers? Scalpers sold tickets on the streets for $150. The second night, all the ticket prices were double. Go easy, Puccini. I will probably fall over dead in the middle of composition. The opera will not be finished, and the conductor will have to stop the orchestra, turn to the audience, and say, here Puccini laid down his pen. Will that be such a tragic loss to the world of music? Does the legacy I leave behind in my music justify my life? I wish it so.
I do not hold myself up as a giant like Wagner. His vision is of such a height that we mere mortals are lifted by his genius. My music is of a more human viewpoint, rooted in reality. Perhaps if the accompaniments, which I dare add to the poetry, enhance the way it touches the heart and stimulates the mind to greater thought. I do wish it so. In the end, I should hope only to amuse. I will write La Comedia. I have never done this. It will spark full of light with much humor, but with a little romance, eh? Scusi, I must begin. Buona notte. to write his comedy, Johnny Skiki, as part of his Trifigo. At the premiere of Johnny Skiki, the entire performance had to be repeated at the audience's demand. His final opera was Turnip. and finale when his chronic throat difficulty was diagnosed as Kent. After weeks of chemotherapy and radiation, surgery was performed. The operation was initially thought to be a success. And after four days, Puccini's heart finally gave out. The premiere of the unfinished Turandot was April 25th, 1926, at La Scala. In the third act, Toscanini stopped the orchestra, put down his baton, turned to the audience, and fulfilling Puccini's own prophecy, said, Here the master laid down his pen. Would Puccini have chosen such a grim epitaph for himself? I think not. With his sense of humor and Joie de Vif, he probably would have turned to the audience and, picking out a few of the prettiest girls, said, Thank you.
treat for you and sing two arias each. <laughs> The aria that was added by Puccini after all the revisions. 